Welcome to our deeper dive this early afternoon or late, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining us. We invite you to share your name in the chat as you settling in where you're at and the role that you play. We would love to learn that as we're building community. Second session in a series of three. My name is Oriana Idas. I'm with the School Crisis and Recovery and Renewal Project. We're so excited to have today's offering, which we'll get into in just a second. We invite you to share links in the chat. We invite you to post questions in the chat and also to share what's surfacing for you as we go through today's offering. We are here with Inner Harbor. We're incredibly fortunate to partner with them in today's offering. This is part two in a series of three, A Deeper Dive, Making Meaning of Grief with College Students, Population Often Overlooked in Supporting in Grief Work. We are funded by SAMHSA and I'm grateful for that. The ideas that are brought to you today are our own. That's the disclaimer. My name is Oriana Idas. I'm with the School Crisis Recovery and Renewal Project. We are deeply committed to creating, promoting, connecting effective and sustainable change within school communities in regards to the skill that we have, the knowledge and attributes necessary for recovery and renewal. We invite you to check out our website and to really connect with us in other ways. There's some really great offerings that we have coming up. Also, you can take a screenshot of this or our slides are up on our website for you to download. We want to offer these mental health resources for you as we experience the content of today and as you continue in your work within your respective communities. These are wonderful assets to support our young people. Today is post-secondary grief student support. It's a three-part training with Inner Harbor. We set the stage last week, and today we're diving deeper into meaning-making in the stages of grief. I will hand this over to Mandy. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, so excited. Thank you to SCRR for having us today. Marie and I are going to do a presentation, and we really hope that you feel comfortable talking and sharing. We're going to have plenty of opportunities for small groups, for larger groups, and for some interactive ways for each of us to get to know each other. So I encourage you all to do that. I happen to be the presenter, but I know that we're in a room full of wisdom and expertise, and I hope that we all get to share and learn from one another. So just a little bit about me and Inner Harbor. I've been working in the field of grief and bereavement for almost 25 years through hospice and a young adult and children's grief. About two and a half years ago, my oldest son, who's a junior in college now, left for school and a friend of his ended up taking his own life just a few days after he got to college as a freshman. This was a boy whose father had died when he was 14. And we can only imagine what happened when he got to college. He didn't have the same supports that were available to him. He had lots of questions and people asking him things that maybe he wasn't prepared for. He used what was available, what he could find quickly to cope with the grief. And that was drugs and alcohol, which he did for a few days before taking his life. It was at that moment that I realized that young adults are forgotten in this space. It's so important that we make sure that we support them through the transition to college and through college. That's really where Inner Harbor was formed. I am so grateful to be able to do this work in his memory, as well as dedicated to all the people that are struggling after a loss. All right, Marie, I'm going to let you introduce yourself as well, and then I hope we can introduce others. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Mairead Peters, and I am the program coordinator for the Cove Center for Grieving Children in Connecticut. I went to school for social work, and I was led to grief work based on my own personal experiences and interest in supporting communities. While the Cove Center originally was just for children. We've since expanded our programs and now offer virtual support for both teens and just added a group for young adults, which I'm really excited about because Mandy said there is certainly a need. And in my own experiences of having lost while in college, I realized that there were limited services. So 
to be able to contribute to that and provide the support that's needed has been really great. I hope to only further do that today and and in instances like this. Thank you all for being here. We're looking forward to today's presentation and to learning about all of you. Mandy, if we're ready, we'll transition to the Jamboard. I'm going to post a link in the chat. It is a Jamboard through Google. Everyone should have access to it as long as you have access to the internet, which we're all here. What you're going to do is click on the Jamboard. I'll share my screen just to show everyone what it looks like. You'll click on the Jamboard link that I just sent, and there's going to be two pages. The first one is here for anyone that attended the last session. We want to hear maybe something that stood out to you. Um, about the presentation or something you learned. You're just going to come over to the side here. You can pick whatever color you want and type in a note about something you learned. And then the second page at the top here is what we just did in the chat. But if you didn't get a chance to share who you are and where you're from, you can do the same thing. Click a sticky note, whatever color is your favorite and post and let us know who you are and your background. We'd love to, to see that. Later on in the presentation, we're going to be doing an activity where you'll have the opportunity to write on a piece of paper, but if you'd prefer to do it virtually, you can just add your own board and we're just going to be drawing lines so you can click on the pen over in the corner here and do that activity on the Jamboard. It'll be anonymous too. Some of the things people are saying they learned last time different forms of loss for college students, differences between loss and grief, how trauma, different ways trauma is defined, the way grief was identified emotionally, physically, behaviorally, and mentally. New Orleans, happy Mardi Gras. And New Jersey, Chile, Wisconsin. I don't know if any of you have used Jamboards before, but they're fairly new to me. There's a ton of different uses and ways that you can use this. I hope that you can practice just by commenting on it. And you might be thinking of ways that you could actually use the Jamboard in your work with grieving students and in tons of other ways as well. I'm excited about this new tool. Yeah, I love seeing all these answers popping up. Or you can feel free to continue to add things to it because all of us can see it. So you can always just click on the link and see what other people are saying. This is so cool. Different types of resources, the domino activity and how true it is. Got someone, let's see if we've got any other. We've got someone in Washington. To New Orleans. I'll just give this another minute. So if you haven't had a chance to put in where you're from and you want to do that now, or if you'd rather just type it in the chat, you can also do that. Bereavement Center in Massachusetts. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Mandy said anyone can go back to this at any time. It's good to get a sense. We have people from all over. It's great to see the different backgrounds of everyone that's here. Like Mandy said, all the expertise that we have across the country. So thank you all for joining. I'll turn it back over to Mandy to get started with our presentation. These are some of the goals and objectives that I had thought about before we get started. If there are things that are coming up for you that you'd like to hear about, you can certainly ask questions in the chat box and we'll have a question and answer time at the end. But if there are things that people were hoping to hear about, put it in the chat box and I'll see if I can squeeze it in somewhere in the presentation. We're talking about grief and trauma, maybe emotional for some of you, maybe going through some pretty significant loss right now. Some of you may just be thinking about losses that have occurred in your life and it can bring up some of the feelings that you've had that maybe you haven't thought about in a while or maybe are pretty raw for you right now. I hope you are able to take good care of yourself during this presentation and have good slippers on or tissues by your side. If there are ways that we can support you throughout the presentation, please let us know if you need something that we can help you with. I hope you have opportunities to take good care of yourself throughout the day. It's 2.15 here in New Jersey, so my day will be coming to an end. I know some of you may have to go right back to work and that can be really challenging. And I hope that you get a few minutes to just get grounded and, and take good care of yourself during the presentation as well as afterwards. We're going to start with talking about post-traumatic stress versus post-traumatic growth. Some of you may have heard that term post-traumatic stress and maybe not post-traumatic growth, but post-traumatic growth is really the 
positive psychological changes that can happen after a highly stressful life experience or circumstance. Post-traumatic growth was something that was first identified by Richard Tedeschi and Lawrence Calhoun of the University of North Carolina. All the way in the 90s, we often hear of post-traumatic stress and not so much about post-traumatic growth, which I think is equally, if not more important to know about. Tedeschi and Calhoun were working with bereaved parents whose children died, and they noticed that while these parents were grieving, they were really concerned about helping one another. They wanted to change the circumstances that had contributed to their children's death and prevent other parents from having to go through the same experience as they did. While working with these bereaved parents, Tedeschi and Calhoun identified five different ways that people can grow after a tragedy. So while stress is something that often happens when something traumatic or tragedy happens to us, there are five ways that people can also grow. The first being that their relationships grow stronger. So these parents being able to support and help one another. The second being discovering new purposes in life. A lot of times we see that after you experience the death of someone significant, it changes your perspective and maybe makes you realize a purpose that you didn't once have. For example, Mothers Against Drunk Driving started after mothers had experienced the death of their children. The third way that people can grow after a tragedy is that the trauma allows them to find inner strength. The fourth is that their spirituality is deepened. A lot of times people are forced to reconsider what what their religion or spirituality was and hopefully are able to deepen that after a tragedy. Finally, they're able to renew their appreciation for life. While experiencing something tragic can be really painful and difficult. They also found that people were able to appreciate life in in ways that they hadn't before. In living through a tragedy or the death of someone significant, you're able to recognize the fragility of life and hopefully are able to move forward and grow and appreciate it more. It was interesting that Tedeschi noticed that this happens, but he questioned how it happens. For some people, it happens naturally. There's not a lot of intervention that's required for people to grow after a trauma. For others, they may need some intervention or might be looking for some intervention. And there's certain things that we all can provide as carers in the environments of grievers to help them grow after a traumatic loss. The first one being education. If you think about when something really terrible happens, oftentimes we need to reconsider our own values and our belief systems. For example, the pandemic may have challenged your own belief, but we're safe from things like global pandemics. It wasn't something certainly in in my wildest imagination two and a half years ago that this something like this can happen. It required me to think about and redefine what my belief systems are. Providing opportunities for students to think about what beliefs have been you know, challenged during the pandemic or even just what experiences they've been through that they never could have imagined before can be really helpful. The second, uh, the second one is emotional regulation. Things like meditation, mindfulness, really intentional communications. These things can help to regulate our emotions when you're feeling out of control. I teach a bereavement class at a local university near me. Each week before we start class, we do a breathing exercise just to help students get grounded present to the moment. They know that we're going to be talking about really emotional things, and we all know that they're going through some really emotional things. We do this breathing exercise my students came up with to help them to get grounded, to shake off what's been going on in their own lives before we get started with class. The next one is constructive self-disclosure, which is really important talking about it, saying out loud what has happened to us can make it more manageable, right? Not just talking about the experience though, but also talking about how it feels. How does it feel in our bodies, in our hearts, this experience that we've gone through? So allowing your students opportunities to talk about what they've been going through is so important. 
I actually shared an Instagram post today that said something like, just because we're all going through, it doesn't mean that it's not traumatic. That's really important because we think about everybody's dealing with it. That doesn't minimize the fact that it's really painful. So giving people opportunities to just talk about their experience can be very powerful. And then narrative development. I struggle a little bit with this one, but I know it's really important. Really thinking about the way we think changes the way that we feel. So it's not to say that you can't have your feelings because we should all be able to have the, the, the painful feelings as well as the more positive, happy feelings. If you think about if somebody was in an accident, they may say this accident ruined my life. I can't do certain things anymore. Or they can say this accident gave me the opportunity to see how many people really care about me. And that changes your feelings. So if you're thinking about the accident ruined my life, that creates this feeling of uh, hopelessness and um, despair. But if you think about the accident gave me this opportunity to see how many people really care about me, that brings you a feeling of hopefulness, right? And, And joy and gratitude. So changing the way we think can help change the way we feel. The pandemic, again, is an example. So many people had some terrible things, death as well as illness and other things that have happened. A student might say that this pandemic has been awful. I miss my vacations. I miss the internship I was supposed to have. I was supposed to go abroad. I missed so many things and that's been awful. Or you can think about it. I'm going to say and or, because you can do both, that the pandemic has had some good things. It's allowed me to spend time with my family. It's allowed me to save money on clothes and gas. It's taught me how to make bread, whatever it is that all of us have done. So the way that we think can often change the way that we feel. I wanted to introduce the sixth stage of grief, which is making meaning. David Kessler, who worked with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross on the five stages, which you probably are all familiar with, He developed the sixth stage. And in his book, he talked about this narrative development and the idea that our thoughts lead to creating meaning. And that meaning is what guides the story that we tell both ourselves and others. So after the experience of a death, you can often feel helpless or hopeless, but we do have control over our thoughts and perceptions about what happened. It's not about what happened to us, but just what happened. Changing that narrative and saying the death happened to me versus death is something that happens and will happen for everyone, or why did this happen to me versus everyone's going to probably experience a significant loss in their life. This can be especially difficult when we're talking about trauma. Oftentimes with post-traumatic stress, people experience reliving that moment when the trauma happened and replaying those images in their head. I have his book right here, Finding Meaning. In the book, he talks about a client that he worked with who was constantly replaying the image of her son's death in her mind and couldn't get that image out. He encouraged her and I would encourage anyone who is experience a trauma to try and actively replace those images of the trauma with positive images of the person who died. That traumatic event of their death was one moment of time and of their life. While there are so many positive images that we can think about when thinking about the person, when that image of the trauma comes up, trying to cognitively replace it with one of a positive memory with the person instead. I agree with the concept of that. And yet I struggle a bit because sometimes somebody just wants to think about that moment. And we're going to talk a little bit later about timing of some of this. Very early on, people do replay images, certain experiences that they've gone through. It's probably not helpful the day after somebody dies to say, don't think about that, think about this. So we're going to talk a little bit more about timing, but ultimately people do have that choice or opportunity to be able to decide, is this helpful for me to be thinking this way? Is there another way that I can be thinking that might be more supportive? I like to put that out there. And the last one is service. Things like donating, donating money. I remember when everybody at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody was making masks, 
right? It was our way of doing something for people. In my little town, people were making lists of local restaurants that needed help so that people can get takeout. We had something called Takeout Tuesday. So they were encouraging people uh, to order takeout to help local restaurants. I also happened to be a big baker. I would, you know, bake things and bring them over to people if they were sick or if they were elder. These things brought meaning and purpose and perspective to our lives that could be really helpful. Students to provide service and give back to communities that could be helpful for them if they're looking for ways to make meaning or why did this happen? What can I do to, to make this not meaningless? Service is one of those ways as well. Probably most of you have heard of the five stages of grief. These stages have actually largely been misused in the field. The original intention by Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, she created them while she was working with people who were dying, not after somebody had died. Somehow these stages stuck in our popular culture as stages of grief instead of stages of accepting your own death. The idea of the stages has been debunked, but the feelings associated with loss have kind of stuck around. So I did want to talk about them a bit. Denial is, she called it the stage, but we can think about denial sometimes in order to cope with these really big feelings associated with grief. We may consciously or not minimize or numb our feelings. Sometimes not even really believing that it happened. I share a story sometimes that at my dad's funeral, we were driving to the cemetery and we were talking about all the people that showed up for the service. I said, I can't wait to tell him that guy came. And then I was like, oh my God, I don't get to tell him he's gone. But these little moments that happened, right? Where you forget that's denial. It's actually a really effective coping strategy that allows us to resist feeling the reality of a situation too intensely all the time. When my dad had cancer, I was working in a hospice. I saw really sick people all the time, but I didn't really want to see my dad as sick. And I remember we went to Sloan Kettering in New York City. He was supposed to be getting chemo that day. The nurse said, you're not going to get chemo today. My dad and I like looked at each other and said, no, we have an appointment. We thought we were getting chemo today. And she said, you can't get chemo when you're jaundice. And I said, he's not jaundice. I work in a hospice. I saw jaundice people all the time. I know what jaundice looks like. You look very yellow. And she said, you're jaundice. And I looked at him and I would have sworn that he was pink. He was not yellow. He was pink. I didn't want my dad to be sick. So I didn't see him as sick. My own sister, the whole time that he was sick, it was about three years and she was sure he was going to get better or there was going to be a cure. And this was just a bad chapter in a long book that was going to continue. And obviously that didn't happen, but I don't think it made the fact that he died any worse for her because she didn't really think it was going to happen when it happened. It was awful for all of us. I think it was just as awful for her. I don't think it was any more awful because she didn't think it was going to happen than I did. I was worrying for three years and she got to live her life and be present to her children and enjoy times with her dad. When I was with my dad, I just kept thinking about, oh my God, this could be the last time. She didn't have that experience. She just enjoyed him. Denial, some people think, oh, it's so bad denial, but actually it can be very productive and it's a really good coping strategy sometimes. Anger is that next stage, we'll call it. Anger is often an easy one for people to express. Underneath that anger, there might be a whole bunch of things. Frequently, people will say that they feel really angry and they can express that. Yeah, they might be angry at themselves. They might be angry at doctors, at God, at the neighbor that said they were going to bring in the mail and didn't. It's not always rational, but it is a fairly common reaction after a loss. Like Mandy said, anger is very easy. It's important that when experiencing anger, we recognize what it is because it will come up most likely and releasing that anger is an important step in uh, beginning the healing process of grief. So in order to release the anger, we have to acknowledge that it's there. Like you said, it could be at anyone. It could be at the situation itself, whether you're angry at God or the universe or whatever you believe in for letting this thing happen to you and letting the person that you love die, we are able to realize when we 
recognize that anger that it isn't God or the universe or whatever that that did that. It's just something that happened. Recognizing that even though our loved one died and we did not, that doesn't mean that it was supposed to be you that died. I think a lot of times people think like, why did this happen to them or, or to my my dad or to whoever? Because, and we feel this sense of it happened to them, but why didn't it happen it to me? Within that anger, we need to recognize that if it were supposed to be you, then it would have been because you are still alive. It's important to start thinking about what you want to do next, because there's a difference between being alive and living, recognizing that anger and being able to transform it into understanding why you're still here and trying to move forward in your healing by identifying how you want to move forward in life and not just be simply alive. The next stage, bargaining, which often the sense of hopelessness prompts us to look for ways to regain control. Bargaining is that begging, begging God or the universe, whoever you believe in, to change things as you promise to do better or different. I've heard people say, I don't even believe in God and I am begging. I'll do better if you could bring my person back. I'll never take them for granted again. Let's pretend that this was a dream, a very bad dream. It's a form of magical thinking. We think of children as engaging in magical thinking, but we adults do that as well. It's a way for us to just try to gain some control over a situation that we often don't have any control over. After we realize that we don't have control, there is often this dip, one of the more common reactions after loss, this sadness, uh, depression, loneliness, hopelessness that we often feel as we begin to understand and absorb the reality of our loss. We may wonder what the point is or question if we can even go on. It's a particularly painful experience but pretty common, most people will question those kinds of things and wonder how they're going to figure out how to live without this person in their life. And then we may get to a place, again, not in stages the way that many people think about it. You might have a moment of any of these things and then go back to another one. Ultimately, the goal is to get to a place where not that we accept the loss, that we're over it but more that we've accepted the reality of the loss. It's understanding that our life has changed and figuring out a little bit more about how we're going to live in it. With moving, with acceptance, it's more not about moving on. This was one of my biggest struggles with this model of grief. It's not about moving on, but instead moving forward. There's a difference between being alive and living. When someone dies, we have to try and live our lives despite that loss. And I just want to share this quote that I actually got from David Kessler's book that was from someone else, but it's a ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. The same way that ships are meant to sail, we are also meant to eventually leave that harbor and learn to live our lives and to love again beyond the death. So David Kessler talks about a sixth stage of grief called meaning making. We're going to watch a short video with David Kessler talking about it. I would just suggest all of you pay attention to your own uh, sound. If you can't hear it or if it's too loud, then just make sure that you adjust your own volume. I have identified a possible sixth stage, and I believe that sixth stage is the stage of meaning. Many people, many years after a loss, will find meaning in that loss. But I caution people, meaning is not something you find at the funeral. Meaning is not something you find in the first year, or first week, or first month. But sometimes when you look at a loss later, you see how that arc of the loss that was left behind by your loved one has helped you to create other things or become a different person or maybe help you find great meaning to go on and do other things in your life. People often think when they hear about meaning that uh, it means it was okay and it was worth it. It's never going to be worth it. Even if you go on to do as many people have 
meaningful nonprofits to help those in grief or mothers against drunk driving after someone lost their child through a drunk driver, you may find great meaning, but it doesn't mean complete understanding. It doesn't mean it's worth the cause. It just means you find a deeper understanding in the years to come. I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you have any thoughts about that video or this idea of making meaning, feel free to put some of those in the chat box. My understanding is that meaning making is like honoring the person, dedicating an act or an intention. It can be big things like he talked about in this video, or it can be small things like appreciating life more or not taking things for granted. Dr. Nehemiah, a psychologist at the University of Memphis, also did a lot of work and helped to originate this term meaning making. He talks about how college students try to make sense of the world after a death through meaning making. He talks about it as a way for them to understand and control their world. I wouldn't call it a silver lining, but perhaps a clarity um, of purpose or a new perspective. Marie and I, mostly Marie, is going to talk a little bit about making meaning. I shared early on that I started this organization in our harbor after my son's friend died. That was a way for me to make meaning of his loss because he was such a bright, shining light. And I just thought his death cannot be for nothing. It just so happens through a few series of coincidences that when he died in his dorm room, his neighbor found him, somebody else on the floor, who happens to be somebody that my son also knows. This boy that found him, his name is Hans Williams, who is a, an aspiring musician. He ended up writing a song called Body on My Shoulders that was about the experience that he had finding somebody in their dorm room that had just died by suicide and what that was going to look like for his life. Making the song was his way of making meaning out of this incredible loss for him. Maria, I thought maybe you could share a little bit about ways that you've made meaning after some pretty significant losses you've experienced. I'm popping the song in the chat. I'll start by saying my first experience with death was when I was five. My brother, my oldest brother died suddenly by suicide. I was very young and I didn't know about the circumstances of his death. As I got older, I realized the suffering that he had while he was alive in his short life. At first experienced anger, definitely. It was clear that he had felt isolated and maybe even bullied while he was in school. So I made this pact with myself to make sure that I didn't contribute to that. And it was something very small and simple as just being kind and uh, compassionate towards people and in school or social settings. If I'd see someone who was off in the corner or seemed like they felt out of place, I made it a point to try and make them feel welcomed and seen. So that was just a small thing. I, I did go to school for social work in part because of my brother while I was in school for social work and trying to make meaning out of that death. My cousin died suddenly my junior year of college Eight months later, my dad also died by suicide. With both of these losses, I was at a crossroads of figuring out what I wanted to do and had to go through the experience of changing my perspective. And like we talked about earlier, changing the narrative. I could have been angry and done a lot of different things with these experiences. Instead of letting them disrupt my life entirely, I decided to make changes and make meaning out of them. With my cousin, she was my age. And one small thing that I took away from her was she was very different from me in that she took risks and did what made her happy and didn't really seek approval from anyone. I'm a very much straight edge person where I felt like I was going to go to school and get my degree and get straight A's. And she couldn't have been farther away on the spectrum. She just did what made her happy and was unapologetic about it. I've learned from her the importance of having the balance in life and understanding that while it is great to succeed and do well, it's also important to have fun and take risks. And one of the Bolder moves that she made while she was in college was her first tattoo she got after her parents begged her not to get it. She did it anyways, because that was her nature. She decided to get her entire back tattooed. I had never considered getting a tattoo. It was just something that 
I felt like I never would have anything in my life that I would want on me forever. But she got a lotus on her back. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the lotus flower, it symbolizes possibility and beauty even in the most difficult or most unforgiving of circumstances. So I got a lotus tattoo um, on my wrist and I also got a semicolon, which represents a pause in a sentence. Some of you might know of the nonprofit called the Project Semicolon, which is intended to provide awareness about mental health and depression and suicide. The semicolon signifies a pause and represents uh, a sentence an author could have ended but chose not to. Their motto is that the author is you and the sentence is your life. And so I have this small reminder of the lotus and the semicolon to remind me of the struggles that my dad and my father went through and also of my cousin with the Lotus and learning to, to have fun in life and to take risks because that is part of enjoying life. It doesn't have to always be uh, so strict. It's my reminder. And that's just one small way I made meaning with her death and my dad's. And then finally with my dad, he struggled a lot with his mental health. It was really hard to connect with him in the later part of his life. And there was one thing that was really easy to connect with him over and that was music and also beer. He loved a good IPA. After he died, I knew that music and beer were really important to him. I wanted to continue to honor that in the way that he did. And so I chose music. I chose to stay away from having a strong connection with beer. I recognized within music and Mandy shared that song, Body on My Shoulders, which resonated a lot with me because of the nature of my dad's. It was such a powerful tool. I found a lot of comfort and solace in music. While I was in school, after my dad died, I had an internship at a nonprofit that works with caregivers of people with Alzheimer's and dementia. One interesting thing I learned about Alzheimer's and dementia is that even in the most advanced stages of those diseases, music is one of the last things to go. I had a woman who was nonverbal. When you started singing, you are my sunshine, she instantly lit up and would smile and sometimes even was able to sing along with us. Seeing this woman who never spoke and couldn't walk or take care of herself, being able to connect with music was just such a powerful thing for me. And so I've taken that connection that I have with music and there are certain songs that I'm able to listen to and feel connected to my dad in that way. Being able to share music with other people has been a really powerful tool for me. I love to share a quote, music expresses that which cannot be said. Music for me has been a really powerful outlet and I think it can be for a lot of people. With my dad's death it was traumatic but I'm able to try and transform, like we talked about earlier, those more traumatic images of more positive ones of listening to music with my dad and visualizing him standing in front of the stereo and blasting music because that's what he wanted to do. Those are just some of the ways that I've made meeting with the deaths that I've had. It isn't to say that I don't also experience the other parts of grief, but these ways that I've found meaning have been instrumental in, in changing my perspective and allowing me to be able to live and not just be alive. I'm grateful for, for meaning making and being able to share that with you all. It's uh, it can be emotional to share and sharing with a group of strangers can be hard and also listening to those stories can be hard. So I want to just honor that wherever you're at and where everybody else is at um, after listening. I'd love to hear from people. If you have ways that you've made meaning after significant loss, feel free to put those in the chat box as well, because lots of people are looking for ways, thinking, what can I do to make this mean something? And lots of us do it in small and large ways. So if you've found ways that you've made meaning after a significant loss or know of other people, I'd love for you to share that with others. For me, it was living my loved one's legacy and really exploring my passion and interest in helping others and revisiting my career path to find something fulfilling for me. It's beautiful. Love that. Yeah, that's a lot of what we've talked about, right? Like that service, that's exactly, exactly what we've been saying. Thank you. Ah, that's a good point. Sometimes people remark on making that actually adds pressure 
to the griever who is not someone who will start a cause like mad. I totally agree, which is why I said I struggle with the idea. Certainly, I think there's a timing. It's more of an art than a science to figuring out. I actually wouldn't even say you should bring it up to someone. I wouldn't say like, how are you going to make meaning out of this? Or let's do this to make meaning because it does add pressure. And sometimes people don't feel like there is meaning, right? This doesn't happen for everyone. To say something like there's got to be meaning, there's always meaning, something like that feels condescending and minimizing of the incredible pain that people are in. You're right. It really needs to come from the griever. David Kessler said it briefly in the video that we watched that it doesn't happen at the funeral. It doesn't happen weeks or even sometimes a year later. It's at some point, someone may say, I'm looking to find meaning, or maybe they've naturally found it on their own. But I totally agree with you. I don't think it's our place to suggest, let's make meaning out of this when people aren't there. I think important to note that there are two types of grievers, active and passive. The ones that go out and start a nonprofit are active and the passive are the ones who don't necessarily take those grand actions just because they're not going out and starting organizations like MAD. It doesn't mean they can't find meaning. You're able to do it in small ways by even sharing your story with someone else who might have a similar experience can be helpful to that other person. And like I talked about in the beginning, the group of parents who had lost a child, just being able to share with one another was a meaningful experience to them. It's important to let let the griever be the one to to make that step and not trying to force them into it. When my dad died and thinking, I don't know how I'm going to live my life without at some point, I don't know exactly when this happened, but at some point I decided, I I remember having this, it was literally a decision that I made that I'm not going to let his death be more powerful to me than his life. And I said, I am going to make sure that his life was more meaningful, more important than his death. So I'm going to do things to remember his life rather than think about his death. So on his birthday, I always donate to an organization that he would care about. I donate like the age that he would be that year, the organizations that he supported, but they wouldn't necessarily be the ones that I support, like his alma mater. But I make a donation sometimes to them just because I know that's something that he cared about. So I try to do things to make his life meaningful rather than his death. That's just a small thing. I'll just share. I saw one more in the chat. Someone who decided to run the Boston Marathon after losing a family member to lung cancer. It's really powerful. But we're going to just talk a little bit about how can you help somebody make meaning after a loss. Activities need to be considered carefully as well as the timing. So it should really come after the griever has expressed an interest or a desire to make some kind of meaning from a loss. Otherwise, it can feel minimizing and even offensive and just totally not understanding where they are. The first thing that I thought about is journaling. Providing someone with a journal is not really pressuring them. It's not something that they have to share with you. It could be a totally unstructured journal just with blank pages, or there are some journals that have prompts in them to help initiate thoughts about grief and memories and dreams. They can use that journal in any way that they want. Sometimes people will use it to think about why did this happen and what do I want to do with these intense feelings um, of loss? So just providing somebody with a journal or opportunities to write or write their thoughts and feelings, write music or poetry or whatever it is that they do can be helpful. Everyone's not a journaler. All of these activities are not going to work for everyone. These are just some ideas that might be helpful. There's another activity. It's called the three house activity. If you're working with somebody who is grieving, if you're in a supportive environment, running groups or working with students individually, and they're talking about, I, I don't understand why this happened and I'm looking for ways, the three house activity might be helpful. You can find them on you know, the internet, just pictures of houses, drawings of a house, and you have three houses. There's a house of worries house of good things happening and a house of dreams. 
And you can encourage people to put their worries, their good things, and their dreams into the different house. Helps them organize and ground them in what's happened to me and where do I want to be? What do I want to happen? How do I hope to make purpose in my life? That's just a more visual activity that some people find helpful. A recipe book can be really helpful. College students in particular, food, great motivator. I know lots of people that will host an activity on a college campus. If there's no pizza, it's going to be hard to get people to come sometimes. Creating recipes, maybe that remind you of the person that died. Young adults are often starting to live more independently, perhaps in their first apartments, and they're looking for some ideas for cooking. So Cooking meals that remind them of home, of the person that died, can create meaning for them. If you're running a group, perhaps you can invite each person to bring a recipe that their person liked or their favorite snack if cooking's not possible. Some of you may have heard of the Dougie Center, a grief support center out in Portland, Oregon. If you go onto their website, it's Dougie, D-O-U-G-Y dot org. They have a recipe template for a recipe book. So you could just print it out and let people create recipes on it. Not only does that allow them to feel connected to the person that died, but depending on how you use a recipe book, you can feel connected to other people as well. I've done this activity. I think, Marie, you've done it at your grief support center as well, where people will bring in their person's favorite food and everybody shares it. Then you feel more connected to other people, which is a way to make meaning, to feel connected to others. I remember doing this at the grief support center that I used to work at. I brought tomatoes with salt. That was my dad's favorite snack. You can make very simple things, but it really does make you feel connected to them and to other people. And then sharing your story can be so powerful. Not only does it let you express yourself, your feelings, share memories, but it lets other people know that they're not alone. Oftentimes people will say, I share my story to help someone else, to let someone else know that they're not alone. And that is a way to make meaning after a loss. College students are particularly adept at social media. I'm all over Instagram Um, And I follow a whole bunch of people who have created Instagram pages because of their loss. So they share stories and other people connect with them. They might share photography or music or poetry. That can be really powerful too. There's one woman, her name is Laura Medeo. There's an Instagram page called Grief Hungry about food. She felt very connected to her dad through food. He was a good cook. She created this page, a metaphor for recipes, but also about this hunger that she has for him and longing for him. People will share their family recipes on her Instagram page or with her, and then she shares them with other people. It creates a sense of community that she never had. It's a very powerful way for her to feel on college campuses. There's some really amazing opportunities and resources available. Even if you think about some of the clubs that are out there on college campuses, Lisa Williams is the co-founder of What's Your Grief, which is a great resource. She shared that the photography club on her college campus really got her through a really significant loss of her father because the photography just let her explore her feelings. It connected her with other people, got her outside. So that was a way for her to make some meaning after the death of her dad. We're going to actually practice a little meaning making. We're going to do a little activity. I hope some of you, if you were able to, if you have a piece of paper and some different colors, pens, pencils, crayons, markers, whatever you have, we're going to do this activity to allow you to think about a loss that maybe you've experienced. It could be something fairly recent or something that happened a long time ago. It can be death, but it also doesn't have to be a death. You may have experienced losses that you're still processing, a job loss, a relationship, the loss of a vacation during the pandemic, or whatever, any other kind of loss that you've experienced. So I'm going to ask you all, we're going to give you a couple of minutes. You can use as many colors as you want. Uh, to make a key to symbolize different feelings related to your grief. And you're going to just make, I'll call it a ball, but it doesn't actually have to look like a ball. When we were talking before about the stages of grief, there's this meme or this illustration out there that I've seen a lot where it looks like steps. That's what we want it to look like. Grief is like you go from here to here and then you get to the top and you're done. But what grief really looks like, it often looks like a ball of yarn that your cat got to. 
and is just a mess. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to do this little ball of grief. We're going to break out into groups in a little bit, but I'm going to give you first a couple of minutes to create a ball or lines or whatever you want. You're going to make a key to symbolize different feelings related to your grief. It might be different colors or different feelings that you have. If you don't have colors, you could do different kinds of lines, thick lines or dotted lines. Or you can use the Jamboard. You can go back to the link that Marie shared. At the top, there's a little plus sign. You can create your own page and create your digital ball of grief. We will be able to see that, but it is anonymous, so we won't know who created it. I'm going to give you about two minutes right now. You can close your screens if you want to or stop sharing your video to work on your drawings individually. Then we're going to do some breakout rooms so you can talk about your keys and how you're feeling mixed together and all of that. We'll do that in a few minutes, but I'll take two minutes right now for you to just to create your balls. If you can, if you're in a space where you feel like you can share a little, you can show your activity if you'd like to, or just talk a little bit about some of the feelings that you've had when you've uh, experienced a loss and how they're intertwined. When you're done with that, we'll come back as a larger group and talk a little bit about what it was like to share your activity and how that helps to create meaning. It'll be about three people. Thank you. Three people in each room. I would love to just open up the floor a little bit. You can either put something in the chat box if you'd like, or just share, just unmute yourself and share a little bit about what it was like to share with other people that you don't know your feelings. What did you notice about other people's grief or your own grief as you did that activity? I'll share. The ball of yarn for me was just fun to make. And I did not really have an association of an emotion or of a stage of grief or of a feeling with any particular color. I just really enjoyed making the ball of yarn. So while that this was easy for me and, and I just enjoyed making this ball of yarn, I do recognize that some folks will have a very polar opposite experience. And so to make sure that I am aware of that as I serve my students. I think it's so powerful to even just recognize and be aware of the fact that we can all have very different experiences and reactions after a loss. I think that's so important to remember because oftentimes I say this all the time that we often do for others what we would want done for ourselves because we think we know. If any of you are parents, you've probably once or twice in your life said 
Um, I know what's best for you, but we don't always know what's best for people. We assume what's best for us might be best for them. Even if this activity helped you to see that by talking to other people and saying we had a very different response or reaction to a loss it can be very powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wanted to share anything about the activity? One thing I want to share is I, I didn't really feel like that was enough time to like process with everybody in our group and both like share and reflect. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else wanted to share anything? I think that's great. It's really interesting to, I don't know if you've thought about it in that way before, but there's something about doing it visually that hopefully maybe brought you some understanding or clarification about what you're going through. So I'm glad. I hope that this activity just maybe sparks some ideas in your own mind about how you can use it in a group. Part of the activity, I hope, just allowed you to think about your own loss and give you a few minutes to honor that and to think about your own feelings. But I also hope that doing it when you went into your breakout rooms and had an opportunity to be in small groups with people, that it gave you this sense of community, that you're not alone, even if that meant we're all feeling differently from one another. So you're together in that differentness, or maybe you found some similarities amongst other people in the group that made you feel like, okay, I'm not alone in my grief. So that's part of that making meaning is knowing that you're not alone. I hope that was powerful or meaningful for some of you. I saw some really powerful questions in the chat box, so I want to get to those as well. I want to talk a little bit about what we learned here today. We talked a lot about post-traumatic growth and these five different strategies to encourage meaning-making after a loss, including education, emotional regulation, constructive self-disclosure, narrative development, and service. We also learned some activities that can be useful when a griever is ready to make meaning, if they ever become ready to make meaning, and ways that they can explore their own values and beliefs and perspectives that are ever-changing for all of us, but certainly after a loss. I also wanted to share some additional resources. I mentioned the Dougie Center before. They have this recipe book on their website that you can download if you're interested. I also put the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. We didn't really talk specifically about suicide loss today, but I put it on there because we talked about service. A lot of times people are looking for ways to give back, to prevent this kind of a loss from happening again. Oftentimes you'll see like in an obituary, somebody will say, instead of flowers, make a donation to... Sometimes it's an organization that was supporting them through an illness. The American Foundation for Suicide Prevention hosts overnight walks to bring awareness to suicide prevention. So I put that on there as a way to think about the different ways that people can be of service after a loss, this one specific to suicide. Also, if you're interested in learning more about post-traumatic growth, I included a video from Richard Tedeschi about the subject. So you can check that out as well. It's a little lengthier than the video that I shared, but it's on there too. So if you're interested in learning more, I would love for you to do that. I also want to share again the, I'll send it in the chat, but the Finding Meaning book by David Kessler. And then another book that's specifically on trauma is What Happened to You by Oprah and Dr. Perry. So that's just conversations about trauma and healing. Both of them, like with Finding Meaning, it talks more in depth about finding meaning in more complicated deaths like suicide or disenfranchised losses, miscarriages or infant loss, and then also finding meaning in complicated relationships, which was one of the questions that came into the, the chat. I actually stopped sharing my screen so we can see each other better and be um, in more community while we answer any questions that people had. I did want to go back to that question. Somebody asked in the chat box about how do you make meaning after someone died that was abusive? I thought it is a really good question and I have some thoughts and yet I'm also almost afraid to share them because the way that I might make meaning is different than the way that you would make meaning. Your relationship with the person, the support systems that you have, 
your own mental health, all of those things play into how you would make meaning after even a complicated loss. If you think about Marie shared some suicide losses, so you may have had complicated relationships with some people if they've been suffering from a mental illness, things like doing that overnight walk, doing something in drug prevention or domestic violence. All of those kinds of things are ways that you may make meaning from a really traumatic, painful situation. You grieve even if I'm always pretty careful not to use that term loved one, because sometimes the person that died was, I always say, less than loved and you still grieve, right? And that person was significant in your life. And when they are gone, you still experience grief. How do you do that? And how do you make meaning from that? If people have thoughts about it, I would love to hear. It's just as important to make meaning because it might not be meaning from their death. It might be meaning from their life. What was the purpose of the pain that they caused or the lack of relationship that you wanted? So how do you make meaning from that? I spoke to a woman once who had a very complicated relationship with her own mom. She said she made a lot of meaning through her own relationships with her children, where she really made a conscious effort to have a different relationship. She learned a lot, not the way she wanted to learn, but she did learn a lot from a very conflicted relationship that she had with her mom about how she wanted to parent when she became a parent. I don't know if other people have thoughts or questions about that. Were there any other questions in the chat box that you remember, Marie? I'm looking through it kind of quickly. No. But if anyone wants to share any questions now. Really great resources in the chat. So feel free to just scroll around and look for them. I did want to share my information, so feel free to reach out if people do have more specific questions. I'm happy to answer them, or if you're looking for more information, I'm happy to share with you directly. Mandy, there's one question. Someone said at the beginning, uh, you talked about limited self-disclosure. Could you talk about that more? Yeah, so self-disclosure meaning sharing of your own story and how important that can be because... Oftentimes we hold on to our stories and we don't share them with other people. That experience can be so incredibly lonely. So disclosing, it often makes something that feels so unmanageable, more manageable. If we can say it, what's that phrase? We can say it, we can do something with it. I don't remember, but, but it makes it more manageable to be able to say it out loud, to, to have somebody witness your experience and connect with you over that. So that's really what I was talking about when I said self-disclosure. If you name it, you can tame it, right? (laughs) Thank you. I knew it was in there. (laughs) I've also heard if you can feel it, you can heal it. And naming is so deeply connected to feeling. Yeah, there's a appropriate self-disclosure. So really assessing. I like to ask what my purpose in sharing is before actually sharing. And then after that, what might be the support who I'm sharing with may need upon hearing, hearing my story. And I love that you asked that question. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, I think it's important to think about, are you the one that's getting support right now? Or are you providing the support? If you're looking for support, if you're the one that has experienced a loss and you're coming to someone, sharing your story can be so powerful. If you're the listener, if you're the one that's being supportive, you have to think about why should I be sharing right now or should I be listening right now? We do have more time. I have one question to pose participants to see within your respective role, what are some of the ways in which you've supported students, young people in processing or making meaning of the the losses they're experiencing. I worked at a a program in San Francisco called Metro, which is a a 
college program at San Francisco State. We had students in advisory roles and also as instructors in small cohorts. And there was so much opportunity within our classes and office hours and just the nature of the relationships we're trying to build with students where we could actually have safe space to to allow them to unpack what they were experiencing. But there were also ways through curriculum and support groups to talk about loss that wasn't directly a loss they experienced that also supported in their grief. We have a few minutes left and I'd love to hear maybe a a few folks share what are ways in which you've been able to create space I could just mention, go back to the um, question about self-disclosure just for a second. It's, it's something that I struggle with because I always feel that sometimes if you give a little of yourself, it gives permission or allows for somebody to, or even puts words to something that someone has trouble with. We could do a whole workshop on self-disclosure. And I like the acronym. I don't know if I used it last week, WAIT. W-A-I-T, why am I talking? And I like to think about that when I am about to self-disclose and I just wait and I say, and I think to myself, like, why am I going to share this? If I'm sharing it because it's going to help the person talk more, to feel more comfortable, to to feel more connected, then that's probably a good use of self-disclosure. But if I'm sharing because... I'm anxious. There's too much silence. It brought up feelings for me that I still need to process and I'm going to use them to to process my own feelings. Then it's probably a better idea to wait. I agree with you. I struggle a lot with self-disclosure myself. I'm a talker and I would share my entire story with all of you if uh, you gave me a minute. It's one of the reasons why I love doing some of these presentations because I get to share a little bit. When I'm working with somebody individually or in a group as the supporter, I don't share as much. It is really complicated, but there are, I think that strategy of waiting and thinking to yourself, why am I about to share what I am? And making sure you're getting good supervision too. It's so important to be able to talk to colleagues or a supervisor or someone about what's coming up for all of us as we're being supportive. I just want to definitely start off by saying I am so grateful to be in this space (laughs) this week and last week because I am not a social worker. I'm not a counselor. I'm not a therapist. I'm an educator. Like you said, I love the comment that you made about don't allow someone's death to be more meaningful than their life. One thing that I'm personally challenged by that was shared in this uh, workshop was the griever has to be ready to make meaning. And I mean, that could happen. You were talking about somebody making meaning as a parent from trauma they experienced decades ago as a child. And so that is going to be a long time. I appreciate the ideas of how do you encourage meaning making without outright asking, how do we make sense out of this? So I guess just us trying to make meaning out of it, and perhaps the students can make meaning out of it, or how can they, you know, turn something so tragic into positive activism or speaking out for a cause. So I think that's one way that we as the professionals are trying to just make some strides that maybe they'll say, oh yes, this will make me feel like I am honoring this person a little bit more. So that's it. I just wanted to share that because it's something that we have, like, it's still pretty fresh and just trying to make sense out of it for everybody. That's a lot that you're going. And as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about meaning making feels really far away at this point. You're just, you're still figuring out what happened. So sitting in that pain Um, allowing people to just share what this has been like, allowing staff to share what it's been like to have to support students when you're still trying to understand and uh, process is a lot. It is. Can I say that we do have on our website some resources and tools for how to memorialize young folks and students and how school communities can support in recovery and renewal. And in a second, I can look for the website to share that with you. And also just want to acknowledge that you saying something publicly, I think, really speaks volumes to the students. The the death of their peer didn't happen in silence, that you as adults and as advocates for young people and students 
see it and feel it and are doing something proactively that just goes such a long way. The silence is really, I think, can be harmful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Is there anything else that folks would like to offer this conversation by way of what your experience or questions you might have? Maybe connection to what Mia shared. I just want to say thank you for putting this all together. It's been great so far. And uh, I've learned a lot. So thank you. Just hearing you say that, I already shared that, like, I created this organization because I wanted to make meaning. And yet sometimes I'm sitting here in my basement and I'm doing this work and you never know, are you making a difference? Or is, am I making meaning? So sometimes I, as I do this work, I sometimes wonder, am I doing enough? Is it worth it? So when I do presentations like this and I get feedback like that, for me, that's so validating to know I am and I should keep going. I should keep doing this because it does, it is powerful work. And I appreciate so much being in community with all of you today and and hearing from all of you and sharing and learning. So thank you so much for saying that. I have a question. Yeah. I was looking at one of the resources that is, I don't even know from what page (laughs) that you all shared where I pulled this resource from, but the the healgrief.org. Does anyone know if the AMF app and the virtual grief support, is that uh, a fee-based platform or is it one that is complimentary? I've actually um, facilitated some of the groups for Heal Grief. So they're free. They're ongoing. You can go for as long as you feel like you need the support. They have young adult groups for people mm-hmm. eating. 30 or 35, something like that. And then they have older groups as well. Free and it's great for college students. It's a great resource. It has a ton of great resources, not just like beyond the app for young adults. Thank you very much. Please feel free to continue to share and wonder in the chat. We have a few closing slides. Thank you all for your participation and your energy. Definitely made this space along with Mandy and Raid a really powerful one. So. Thank you for contributing in the ways that you have. Next session on March 25th is the the final in this series of three, and it will be connecting school systems. Mandy shared that much of the reason she is in this work is there was not much for college students. So how do we bridge what our middle school and high school schools and students are doing or need with higher education? That is March 25th. We really hope that you can join us for that. We also please ask you to take a few minutes to offer your feedback. There is a link in the chat that will lead you to an evaluation feedback form. Here are more resources that we invite you to engage with. Something that is definitely coming up for me as you're speaking is we've been holding life after loss tables for educators and It's been space for educators to process the ways in which the loss of their students has shown up in their own lives. So we'll have a listening in session coming soon and a space for people to hear about what that process has been like. And then we're also training people to lead tables like that within their communities. You can find that information on our website and I can reach out to you specifically with the links if you're interested. So the 25th of March is here that listen, learn, and lead consultancy chats are also a great place to be in actual conversation and kind of problem solving with folks. We invite you to register for that. Grief responsive teaching, supporting students and ourselves in times of loss is a workshop and book club upcoming. And then the space that I'm really excited about, I'll be co-leading with a colleague, Nor Jones Bay, and we'll be examining our own wellness and barriers that impede our wellness through the process called a critical friends group. We'll be constructing that together with some gathering of data. Really powerful grief sensitivity virtual learning institute is coming up February 23rd and 24th. The fourth is specifically centered around school 
tools, but both days will be incredibly powerful with a wide variety of speakers. Also join us for our healing school communities, Shifting the Dominant Paradigm, where we're examining the impact of racial violence on BIPOC young folks, how to interrupt it and how to create cultures of healing within school systems. Please feel free to, we welcome you to, we'd love you to be in contact with us. Here's our email, our socials. Thank you so much for your time and energy.